very international community this year. We have people coming from Asia, from Europe, from the States, and from Mexico. We, this is the third Cosmology on the Beach uh, school. The first one was held two years ago in Los Cabos. Last year we had it in Playa del Carmen. And we're switching from the Pacific Coast to the Caribbean Coast. So next year we'll have it in the Caribbean Coast where the uh, 2012 Mayan end of the world will take place. <laughs> and uh, we hope that uh, you had a pleasant uh, trip to, to Puerto Vallarta and that you will enjoy the school, the conferences. We have very good speakers uh, this year and uh, we hope you enjoy the food and the sun. We have a large break during the, uh, uh, in the middle of the, of the day so you can enjoy the beach and uh, the volleyball. And we invite uh, everybody to try to join uh, activities in order to make a, a group. We have decided uh, to, to keep this cosmology on the beach on a small basis. We have accepted only 100 participants, even though there were more than 200 applicants. And the idea is to have a, a smaller community. And uh, so we are starting uh, this morning session with Alicia Verde, and she's going to speak on statistical and numerical methods in cosmology. Okay, good morning everyone, and uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for uh, uh, setting all us up in this uh, amazing place. Uh, this must be the only room in the hotel where there's uh, no drink and food <laughs> available 24 hours a day, <laughs> so it's good for concentration, uh, not enough for waking up that early in the morning. Okay. So uh, my lectures are going to be about uh, statistical techniques, and uh, we also talk about a little bit of numerical techniques for data analysis in cosmology. And I put here uh, a couple of references. These are some notes uh, I wrote from uh, uh, a couple of courses I gave. And then there is the famous numerical recipe book, which I sometimes will refer to as the Bible. Uh, I will give you some other uh, references as we get along and then a final list of references at the end. So this is me, and if you want to know more about me, you can find it there. So that's the outline. Uh, in the first lecture, I want to introduce uh, bias and, uh, and frequentist, uh, talk a bit about priors, importance of Gaussian distribution, modeling statistical inference, and there is sometimes some useful tools. Then, in the next lecture, we go on to Monte Carlo methods, different type of errors, and trying to go beyond the simple parameters fitting. And then in lecture three, we uh, start talking about forecastings, which means uh, estimating the error bars of your experiment before you actually make the experiment and take the data. And a useful tool is the Fisher matrix approach, and I will also give you an introduction to model selection and conclusions. So what it is all about? Uh, statistics is uh, popping up everywhere in cosmology. Uh, there are large data sets. You want to compare and combine different data sets. The error bars as the data set gets large starts shrinking, et cetera, et cetera. And so my goal here is basically to give you like a starter kit, a practical manual, and uh, you know, a bag of tricks a uh, cheat sheet, uh, but uh, no long proof of theorems or anything like that. Now, many of you probably have already been working with uh, statistics and, uh, and cosmology, and so uh, I wonder how many of you are already familiar with everything I'm saying I'm gonna talk about. Don't be shy. Okay, so let's do the following. Since uh, along this lecture, I will suggest exercises and things like that, uh, help the others. <laughs> because these things uh, are a little bit difficult to digest very quickly, and so that's, that's your job. Okay, 
So uh, first of all, we have to start talking about probabilities. Uh, probability can be interpreted as a frequency, okay? So it's uh, uh, the number of uh, positive outcome compared to the total number of trials. So that's the way you define probability uh, in the limit that your total number of trials grows a lot. And so at this point, very from the beginning, we need to introduce uh, two different approaches, frequentist versus Bayesian. So what do we mean? So for frequentist, events are frequencies of occurrence. Probability are only defined as the quantity that are obtained in the limit where the number of independent trials tend to infinity, okay? While Bayesians interpret probabilities in a little bit broader sense as a degree of belief in an hypothesis. So you can, judge, uh, you can use judgment, prior information, probability theory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, Bayesian and frequentist often criticize each other, and this is to put it mildly, okay? But what has happened, I think, is that many physicists, what they are starting to do is basically they are taking a more pragmatic approach and basically decide what method to use depending on the problem they have in front and depending whether they can solve it or not and how they can solve it. And so we'll see a little bit of, of this. So. Uh, probability distribution are fundamental concept and we need to start talking about probability distribution first. So if you want to do confidence interval modeling, you need to know that. So first we need to introduce the concept of a random variable. Okay, so for this slide it's gonna be called X. So the random variable can be the cosmic microwave background temperature in a pixel, or it could be the number of galaxies in a little volume in your galaxy surveys, or it could be the value of your measure power spectrum in a given uh, K band, band power, band, band pass, et cetera. So the probability that your random variable X take a specific value is given by P of X, and that's your probability distribution. And now, uh, you will want to use, rather than P of X, the probability density. So P of X times DX. But for everything I'm gonna say for this slide, then the DX the cancel, but keep that in mind. So uh, what are the properties of the probability distribution? First, it's non-negative real number for all real value of X. Then it's normalized so that when you integrate, it gives you one. Now, of course, if you have a discrete distribution rather than a continuous one, you can substitute this integral by a sum, okay? And then for mutually exclusive event, x1 and x2, the probability sum. And sometimes you will find this written in this way. And in general, you can write the following. The probability of event A and B is given by the probability of A times the probability of B, given that you have A already. And then, of course, you can also write it the other way around, P of B comma A, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, I leave you as an example, as an exercise, to produce for yourself an example of the last case. Right, I don't know. Uh, what's the probability of finding somebody wearing glasses and being blonde? You know, that sort of things. And try to think about something like that because it's useful for later on. All right, so we can also say that the probability of A and B is equal probability of B and A, okay? Now, this seems trivial and tautological, but we're gonna see in the next slide that this will give you, will, will let you make a step that is gonna be very, very important. So we may want to add that uh, if you want the probability of A, but you have the probability of A and B, you may want to sum or integrate over all B possibility to get the probability of A. Sounds obvious, but this will be useful later on when we talk about marginalization. Okay, so let's get to the important things that I wanted to say to anticipate this all. So this is, uh, Mr. Bayes, actually Reverend Bayes, because he was uh, a clergyman, that apparently clergyman uh, in, uh, in England at that time, in the 1700s or so, had a lot of time in their spare time in their hands, and so basically became a statistician in his spare time. And this is what Bayes' theorem says. 
Uh, so let's spell it out. The probability of H given D is the probability of H times the probability of D given H divided by the probability of D. Now, this comes from basically autotology. You're basically saying this, and then you're saying that P of A in B is equal of P of B and A. And then you make the substitution, B goes into H, and A goes into D. Now, the big step after having written this tautology is to interpret H like hypothesis and D like data. And now this becomes an extremely important equation. So this is called the posterior, is the probability of your hypothesis given the data. This is the prior, the probability of your hypothesis. And this is the likelihood, the probability of the data given your hypothesis. Now, I want to leave this expression for the moment general, but for a specific example, interpret your hypothesis as you have a model, say the lambda CDM model, and then, but you can vary the parameters of the lambda CDM model. So omega matter could be 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what this is telling you is telling you a way to make the connection between the probability of your data for a given set of cosmological parameters and connect that to the probability of those set of parameters given your data. So this term is called the likelihood, this term is called the posterior, and forgetting for the moment the normalization factor, but we'll come back to that later on, the two are connected by this, by this prior. So the natural question that they come out next is uh, how do you choose your prior? So we'll come back to this in a little bit. But let's go back to this connection between the posterior and the likelihood. There is a fundamental difference between saying, I give you an hypothesis, what's the probability of the data, from I give you the data, what's the probability of your hypothesis or your cosmological parameters? Because when you do that, you're doing statistical inference, which is what we want to do normally in cosmology, right? Uh, so let's give some examples for discussions about uh, introducing the prior. So let's take uh, a quantity, R, tensor to scalar ratio, that you know is positive definite, and it, you know, it can be positive, it can only be positive. So what prior should you choose? Should you choose a prior like a log R, so you know you force it to be greater than zero, or should you, put, or you, should you choose R? And a similar thing for tau, which is uh, the integrated optical depth to the last scattering surface. Should you use tau or log tau or e to the minus two tau, which is the variable big uh, z that, uh, that sometimes you find in papers? And so uh, we can try to compare p of x with p of f of x, like for example r and log r, right? So what's the relation between the two? Well, the relation between the two is this, P of X is e P of X of F times the, the Jacobian of the transformation. And so you already see where the prior comes in. Uh, let me show you another example. So these are uh, the likelihood contour in, well, it's actually the posterior contour in the omega matter, omega lambda plane taken from uh, papers from two different releases of the WMAP data. That's from 2003, that's the first release, and that's from 2007. That is uh, more than doubling the amount of data. And now, uh, look at the contour. So this gray region was for WMAP only, and now, with more than double of the data, the gray region are doubly map only, they don't even close. What's going on? It can't be, right? You add data, so your contour should shrink. They didn't. Why? Well, because what is being plotted here are posteriors. And so there's the prior in the middle, okay? And so uh, the prior here is a uniform prior in omega lambda, while, the, pri while the, in the, the, the prior here was, uh, was a different quantity, was uh, position of the peaks and things like that. And so basically, you are giving a slightly different prior distribution. And when uh, the data don't constrain you well enough, then the prior takes over, and then you see the difference, OK? However, not all is bad. The prior is important and useful. So imagine you have these five data here, 
right? And, uh, and then uh, you say you want to uh, check whether, uh, whether these uh, two data belong to the same sample or not, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you know that you have your prior and that these are drawn from an underlying distribution, which is just a straight line between X and Y, then with this prior, you can sort of predict whether these other two data points are gonna appear or whether these two points belong to the same distribution or not. But if you don't have this prior and all your base don't have this point, you could fit a line, a curve, a sign, whatever, and then you have basically no uh, predictive power. So priors are not generally bad, but you need to know how to deal with them. Okay, so after the prior, let's, uh, we introduce probability distribution, so let's see how we can characterize probability distribution. So one way it's uh, to define the mean of your probability distribution, so the mean is just defined as uh, integral over with a weight that is uh, given by your your probability distribution, and so averages. And the next thing you want to define are called moments, and moments are, well, you know, very close to averages, except that <laughs> you have this inside your average operation at some n power. And central moment is when you subtract the mean. So moments and central moments, if your x has zero mean, then they, they, they will coincide. And so, for example, mu2 is called the variance, and mu3 is called the skewness, and mu4 is related to the kurtosis. And I say it's related to the kurtosis because uh, uh, when things are non-Gaussian, they always get complicated, and we'll see why, and you will learn to love the Gaussian. So uh, this, I'm sure you've seen it before, is the Gaussian or normal distribution. So that's the mean, and that's you know, your famous bell curve around it. But you know, there could be, not all distributions have this form, so you could have tails on one side, and then this becomes a skewness, but then in this case, mu is not the mean anymore, it's just the maximum. Or your distribution could be a little bit broader than a Gaussian and flatten, or a little bit more peaked, and then this gets uh, um, quantified by the kurtosis. And so for a, a Gaussian distribution, all the moments are completely specified by mu2, okay? But for non-Gaussian distribution, having mu2 is not enough to specify all the higher order moments. And so you see, for example, so you need the cumulants that uh, here I call K, and you see the relation here between central moment and cumulant, for example, for the first six orders. And so you see up to uh, the, the, the skewness, the moment and the cumulant coincide, but after that, things get more complicated. So for Gaussian distribution, all moments of order higher than two are completely specified by mu1. Well, in this case, we're taking it to be zero and mu2. For non-Gaussian, things get more complicated. So uh, this may look like black magic, and uh, I'm gonna show you another trick to do a little bit more black magic and actually work out all these terms. And this trick is based on the generating function. And probably if you've heard about uh, these kind of tools already in you know, physics classes and things like that, so we are borrowing from there. So uh, you define a generating function uh, for your random variable x, something like that. So this is an average, so you've integrated over your probability distribution, and the fact that you've taken this exponential, it sort of reminds you of Fourier transform. Well, let's just leave it at this for the moment. And now what I'm gonna say is that if I expand the exponential, right, I can rewrite this generating function as this, and look, the moments appear here. That's useful because then if I want to know my moments, I just need to take derivative of my generating function if I have the generating function. And you may want to check that cumulants are then obtained by doing the same operation but on the log of this quantity. 
no, I'm not going to prove anything. I'm just going to leave you this here just as a tool in case you need to use it. So uh, if uh, uh, any of you is thinking about uh, you know, the initial condition of, uh, of the universe, whether they were Gaussian as predicted by inflation or not, as predicted by other model of infection, et cetera, you will probably need this eventually. So why Gaussian is so interesting and important? Well, uh, beside inflation, is due to what is called the central limit theorem. So what does the central limit theorem say? The central limit theorem says that if you have a superposition of a lot of independent uh, uh, processes, in the limit where a lot becomes very large, the, the, uh, the combination of all this the distribution of that will tend to a Gaussian. So it's a, like sort of a low or big numbers and everything tends to a Gaussian. And now that we have the tools of the generating functional in hand, we can actually prove the central limit theorem in a couple of lines. And so this is one of the very few proof I'm gonna show you, but since it's a two line, we may as well try. So you, if you have an event and you have P of xi, let's take the average equal zero for simplicity, and let y be their superposition, their sum. So what's p of the superposition of all this n event, p of y? And so let's take the generating functional of y, and then we need to basically do this. And then if we, we can expand this in series, and then this becomes that, and you see that for n, beca that becomes very large, this uh, generating functional becomes this, and well, this is a Gaussian. So this is very, very useful. That's why we love Gaussian a lot. There are exceptions, however. So the condition for this to happen are mild, and most of the distribution you will encounter will actually satisfy that but there are exceptions. So you want the variance to be finite for your distribution you start off with. For example, if you start off with a Cauchy distribution, then the central limit theorem doesn't hold. So you can be fooled by applying the central limit theorem blindly. However, this is the, basically the only distribution I know that doesn't comply. So. Another uh, interesting distribution that we may want to mention is the Poisson distribution. And why I'm mentioning the Poisson distribution? Because Poisson distribution always comes in when you have discrete effects, say, you know, discrete number of photons that arrive in your detector or discrete number of galaxies in your survey. And so let's also uh, try to, to work out what's a Poisson distribution, again, with the tool we have seen. So imagine you have a discrete distribution of galaxies uh, in your survey, and now you divide your volume in a grid and you make the grid cells that are small enough so that basically you only have the possibility of having one object in one cell or zero object in that cell. And then of course, the probability of getting one object in the cell is the density times the volume element and the probability of getting zero, it's one minus that because we've seen that we only have one or, two, one or zero. And so we can write the generating functional for that because because we know, because we only have P1 and P0, so here it is. And uh, so that's, that's this, and what's the probability that would actually give you something like that? If you did the substitution rho V goes to lambda, uh, you get a Poisson. So uh, now we started by putting points in a grid and we came out by just writing the Poisson distribution. So uh, this black magic is, is, is very useful. All right, so uh, let's recap of the importance of being Gaussian. Doing calculation with the Gaussian distribution, it's possible in many times to do that analytically. And so we like that. <laughs> so we want to approximate things with Gaussian whenever possible. It's simple. We have the central limit theorem that says that in many cases you end up with a Gaussian, even if you started off with something that is non-Gaussian. And also in cosmology, we have the theoretical motivation given by the paradigm of inflation. Okay, so 
so far, we started about, uh, we talked about probability distribution like in a more mathematical way or statistical way. And let's try to bring it closer to the applications in cosmology. So to do that, we need to introduce the concept of uh, random fields and how random fields are related to probabilities in cosmology. So let's start with a slightly different but related issue or question. Would it make sense in cosmology to try from your theory to say, I want to predict what's the probability of that galaxy, say M31 or whatever, to appear there in that specific point in the sky? And now don't ask me if M31 today is really there because I'm completely displaced. You know, I woke up from the plane and I opened the window and I found that the Big Dipper was sitting on the horizon and <laughs> that's upsetting. All right. Uh, no, right? So what you want to do with cosmology, usually you want to predict average statistical properties. And so for that, we need to have in mind the concept of a random field, and not simply a random variable. And so one particularly important uh, random field that we all have in mind is the overdensity, you know, as a function of point in space. And you can imagine that as being, for example, the dark matter overdensity distribution or galaxy over density distribution, so define as delta rho over rho average. In addition, in cosmology, we have an extra complication from this. Um, that is, uh, our visible universe is uh, not the whole that there is out there, and it's just one realization of all the possible fictitious example of universes that Mother Nature could have generated from the same set of hypotheses and cosmological parameters, right? Which is a, a kind of issue that statisticians don't always deal with. But in cosmology, we do have to deal with that. Uh, so basically, our observable universe, it's part of this example of uh, ensemble of a uh, lot of different other observable universes. And what we want to do usually in cosmology is not to get the properties of your observable universe, but the property of the ensemble from which your observable universe was drawn from. So this is an extra complication, and we'll see why uh, that's important. OK, so, uh, so then you want to do inferences from that. So when you say, I want to know the value for omega matter and some probability distribution around it, you want to do that from the patch of your observable universe. No, you want to do that for all the possible exam example of what could have been your observable universes. And so from here comes the cosmological principles. Uh, models of the universe are homogeneous on average, so in widely separated region of the universe, the density field has the same statistical properties. And so your crucial assumption is that what you can, if what you can probe is a fair sample of the universe, then you can apply ergodicity that says averaging over many realizations, it's equivalent to averaging over a large enough volume. And so if I have a survey that is large enough, I can split my survey in subvolume if, if each of these subvolume is large enough. By looking at the statistical properties between all these volumes, I can infer something about the statistical properties of this ensemble, fictitious ensemble of all the possible universes. So you can see from this that your tools need to be statistical. So you can't predict that galaxy is gonna form there but you want to do correlation, function, averages, and things like that. And so here, where the big advantage of being Bayesian comes in, and that's why many cosmologists tend to use Bayesian tools. So let me give you uh, the, uh, an example. So let's take an urn that in reality is not transparent, but I draw it transparent so you can see what I'm talking about. And in this urn, there are some red ball and some blue balls. Now, if you know your distribution in the urn of red and blue, then it's very easy, using probability theory, to know when if you pick one, what's the probability of getting red or what's the probability of getting blue. And also it's easy to predict that if I draw 
uh, five, what's the probability for me to get even two red, three blue, five blue, or whatever, and then you go to the casino and you can you know, sort of play with that. Uh, but what you want to do in cosmology usually is the inverse problem. You don't know what's this distribution of red and blue inside your urn. You want to draw a few samples from it, and you want to infer from there what was the red and blue uh, ratio. And it's even worse than that, because you are given one urn, but in reality, imagine that uh, you know, the urn only have an odd number of, uh, of uh, ball inside, okay? Uh, because that's how it come out of uh, factory. And imagine that the, that the underlying distribution is 50-50. So you can't have exact 50-50 in a single urn. But in all the urn that come out from the factory, right, statistically on average, they'll be 50-50. So what you want to do in cosmology is having only one urn, you want to get the probability distribution of what came out of the factory that you don't have access to. And so this is what goes under the name of cosmic variance. So you see one observable universe, but in reality that observable universe comes from an ensemble of different observable universes that could have been generated from the same underlying model. And so, or if you have a large galaxy survey in here where ergodicity comes from, you say, well, I may want to actually try to estimate those probability by taking sub-volumes of that. As long as each sub-volume is large enough and is a fair sample of the entire universe, then I can use the statistics of the difference between the sub-volumes to actually infer something about the ensemble. Okay. So, things... Uh, We've introduced random fields and we introduced this concept in uh, for co the relation to cosmology and I think I convinced you how important is Gaussianity. Let's say a few words about Gaussian random field. So if delta, which you can interpret as delta rho over rho, it's a random field with average zero, its probability distribution is given by something like that. And this is now a multivariate Gaussian. So that's not a, a simple bell curve because you don't want just the probability of x, that is delta at point x, you want the probability of delta at point x1, x2, x3, and everywhere. So you have field now, not, not a variable. And this c here, uh, it's the uh, covariance, it's uh, the average of delta i, delta j, and this will be very useful, but we're going to be back to this later, and some of you will already see that this is related to the power spectrum, and that's why the power spectrum pops up everywhere in cosmology. And so property number one of this thing, a Gaussian random field in Fourier space is still a Gaussian. Everybody familiar with going to Fourier space, et cetera, et cetera? Good. Property number two, real and imaginary part of the coefficients then are randomly distributed and mutually independent. And this is how this looks for a Gaussian random field. Property number three, from here it follows that the phases of the Fourier modes are random. So if I now write instead of real and imaginary with this uh, phase, then that's what I get. And if you write that, it then follow that the probability distribution of the norm, it follow Rayleigh distribution. So from here, sometimes the name of Gaussian random phases for say the initial condition or Gaussian field in cosmology. And the other important property is that this quantity completely specifies your Gaussian random field. And this is the equivalent of the mu2 that we saw when we were introducing probability distributions. Now, uh, with this, I think you can generate a Gaussian random field. That's all you need to know. So if your advisor say, generate me a Gaussian random field, that's all you need to know, and you can do it. Now, if your advisor say, generate me some initial condition for an end body simulation that are consistent with the field by N Gaussian at the beginning, that's not all you need to know. Because you need to put the velocities in there also, right? You will need to move the particle in the evolution of an end body simulation. But if you just want to generate a Gaussian random field for, you know, generating mock catalogs or things like that, 
That's all you need. And I'd like you to think how to actually implement it. Okay, so it also follows that uh, uh, the probability that your amplitude, this, it's above a certain threshold, it's, uh, it's this, with, where, I, where I just integrated from a threshold above the expression that I had before. And this may be interesting and useful to you in case you want to know what uh, uh, galaxy bias is, because one of the original derivation of the fact that if you take a Gaussian field, you take the peaks, and the, proper, the statistical properties of the peaks are, are specified, completely specified by the statistical property of the underlying field, etc. It's all based on this kind of equation. Okay, so is the density field, for example, of the dark matter distribution today Gaussian? Well, today, no way. I mean, this is a snapshot from an n-body simulation. I think it's from the Virgo Consortium, so it's a few years back. This is obviously even by I non-Gaussian. But the issue is, what about the beginning, right? If, if inflation is the theory that gives us the initial condition, then inflation tells you that the deviation for Gaussianity, if they are there, they're extremely small. And then it's a whole big question of whether small is detectable, et cetera, et cetera. But you can, since this is important now, you can generate a Gaussian random field. Now, since you all know about uh, Fourier, then I'm, I'm probably going to skip uh, some of these things, unless you complain. OK? Well, let me just say this. So uh, in many cases, you want to define your uh, random field, whether initial or evolve, by one number that quantifies uh, you know, what's the amplitude of the perturbations in your field. And uh, so sometimes, so the, the quantity that is being used a lot is this sigma square. And sigma square is basically these quantities, the correlation function as zero lag. And you can define it as an integral over the power spectrum. Uh, one quantity that uh, many times you see introduced and reported in plot is this quantity, this delta square uh, of k. I've read it this way from the Fourier transform that I use, but this uh, right-hand side of the equation may change depending on the Fourier transform that you use, but this quantity here is independent on the Fourier transform convention. So it's a useful quantity, for example, to plot, because then different people can actually compare each other without saying, where are your factors of two pi's? But the big question that I ask at this point is, when you say this, on what scale do you define this, uh, this sigma? And so uh, you want to introduce, to have clear the concept of filters. So the typical choice means that on what scales do I define uh, this quantity, well, I filter my field, I put, uh, say, uh, a low-pass filter, and then, and then I'll do this or this. And so typical choices are Gaussians or top-hat filters. And depending on the problem, depending whether you're working in Fourier space or in real space, you may want to use one or the other one. And there are some problems that will actually require you to use one, but since uh, this thing is highly oscillatory, and these things, when you Fourier transform it, you see it remains well behaved. You may want to use the other one and then sort of cross your finger and make some uh, connection between the two. And a typical example of this is when you go through the pressure schechter derivation, you, you do some trick like that. And remember, convolution in real space is a multiplication in Fourier space. Multiplication in real space is a convolution in Fourier space. So power spectrum and correlation function have the same information in them. But getting that information out and interpreting it may be easier in one case or in the other one, depending on the problem you're looking at, exactly because of this. Because convolution is a multiplication in Fourier space, but multiplication in real space is a convolution in Fourier space. And so we can talk a little bit more if you have uh, uh, questions about this. Uh, so let me give you an exercise back to uh, multivariate Gaussian. 
So we've seen this before, and we are seeing that this uh, covariance, the element of this covariance matrix as the average of delta i, delta j, show that if this delta i are Fourier modes, then this quantity is diagonal. So that's very useful, because this is telling you that for Gaussian fields, different k modes are independent. So what does it mean that K modes are independent? It means that when you look at your power spectrum, right, you don't have mode-to-mode -mode correlation. And so your covariance matrix is diagonal, and we'll see in a moment that when covariance matrix is diagonal, everything simplifies, and some things you can even do it analytically or by hand, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why the power spectrum is being used. So widely. So do you all know what the power spectrum is, right? I don't have to define that. Yeah? Okay. So let's go back for a moment to moments and cumulant. So remember this slide here, right? But this was for probability distribution of a random variable. Now we have random fields. And so this thing becomes a little bit more complicated. And so uh, if you want, say, to say for, the, for my uh, random field, I want to know the property of, say, the six-point function, delta one, blah, 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 to delta six. Uh, it, now you don't have mu's anywhere here. You have, you know, power spectra or correlation function. And there is a theorem that is called Wick's theorem, which is a method of reducing higher derivative to combinatorics. And again, you probably have seen this in your physics classes. And from that, it follows the cumulant expansion theorem. And so it's basically the equivalent of this, but sometimes it's easier to use this to compute uh, all this, uh, to split out uh, this uh, complex uh, higher order correlation in uh, uh, several, uh, uh, the equivalent of the cumulant, the connected part. I'm gonna leave it at that, just in case you encounter a problem like this, you know where to go and look for the solution. Okay. So let me move on and talk about modeling of data and statistical inference, because we've, we've talked enough about uh, introductory stuff. Now, when you, f when you enter into this issue, look at the book Numerical Recipe, Chapter 15. I read it again. And then when you have to apply all this to, actual, to our actual real problem, go take the book and read it again. So this is my advice. So let's take an example. So you have some points, x1, y1, x2, y2, et cetera, et cetera. These are your data points. And uh, you basically want to fit this with a model and say that your model is a straight line. You need a figure of merit because you, know, you may want to try to fit it with this straight line, with this straight line. Obviously, a straight line like this will be better than any of the other two. But you need a figure of merit to tell you which one is better. So, uh, the typical things, the first thing that you've done probably even in high school is to do least square. But let's try to put this in a little bit more rigorous context. So what do you want ideally from this kind of uh, figure of merit for doing fits? You want best fit parameters, that's good. You want error estimates on these parameters, and possibly you want a statistical measure of the goodness of this fit. Because uh, uh, imagine I have something like this and my model is a sine function. Maybe it's not as good as a straight line. So if you're Bayesian, what you want to ask is, what is the probability that a particular set of parameter is correct? Or that a particular type of fitting function is correct? But what a figure of merit can give you is, given a set of parameter, this is the probability that that of the occurrence of this data. So, so the two are not the same thing. This is what you want, and this is what you can easily get. So let's try to understand this, and then try to see how we can make the connection from this to that. So the least square fit is the simplest thing that we've seen, that you've probably seen before. You take a distance between your fitting function and your data, you square it, and you give it a weight, and you can show that the minimum variance weight are this being one over sigma 
i or sigma one if, uh, if uh, the, the errors are all the same for all your data points squared. So that one over the variance. But what if data are correlated? Well, if data are correlated, you can't write something like that, then you need to introduce your uh, covariance matrix here, and then you do data minus fit, data minus fit, and then with your full covariance with off diagonal terms in there. Now, of course, it's much, much easier to compute something like that than to compute something like that. And of course, this reduced to something like that in case this quantity, this matrix is diagonal. So in general, this is called doing a chi-square fit, okay? Goodness of fit, can we get a goodness of fit out of this? Well, if all is Gaussian, the probability of chi-square at the minimum follow a chi-square distribution, and the chi-square distribution will be specified by the number of degrees of freedom, which is given by n minus n, with n is the number of data point and m is the number of parameters that you are trying to fit. And so uh, the p, the, that the probability that in case your best, your best fit is really the true underlying model and, and the probability that a, diff, a chi square will be smaller than that for this uh, number of degrees of freedom is given by the gamma function. See, this is a complete gamma function, and you can define also the complementary one, one minus gamma, which is called Q. And the goodness of fit, this gives you a, a, a handle on the goodness of fit if you evaluate it at the best fit, because it tells you what the probability that your chi-square would have been smaller than that, even in, in, in the right, if you were in the right case. So it's good to have in mind what happens if you do this, and you find a Q that is uh, either too small or too large. So if it's too small, it means that probably your model is wrong. Try again with a different model. Or it simply means that the, the error bars are larger than you thought. You have underestimated the error bar. This happens quite a lot. Or it, may, it means that really you have assumed Gaussianity and things are highly non-Gaussian. I don't know, the error are asymmetric or things like that. In general, you want to Monte Carlo simulate, and we'll see next lecture what that means. In some cases, you may find a too large value for Q. So usually things are never too good to be true. <laughs> and this is telling you that things are too good to be true. So when things are too good to be true, means probably that the error are overestimated, or that you've neglected some covariance effect. And uh, you may ask uh, whether maybe you have some sort of deviation from Gaussianity that may introduce something like this, but this almost never happens. So before you go and worry about this, if you find a too large Q, worry about A and B a lot before going and worry about C. And does um, anybody know about what is the key by I? So when I say that uh, the value for the chi-square needs to be more or less the number of uh, data points you have, and so the key by I says you take the chi-square divided by the number of data points, and that should be about unity. Now, the key by I, it's basically telling you uh, what's the probability, what, what's the, the, the behavior of this Q function, but you want to use the Q function and not the key by I. And so since I have uh, only a few minutes left, let me introduce the concept of uh, confidence region and then, and then we'll stop there. So this is if you want to, comp to get a uh, goodness of fit. But now let's do one step back and try to estimate instead error bars around the parameter you estimated. And so you can also derive that from the goodness of fit. And so if M is the number of fit the parameter from which you want to plot joint confidence region and P is the confidence limit the desire, you want to find the delta chi-square such that the probability of a chi-square variable with M degrees of freedom is less, the less than delta chi-square is given by P. And to do that, you may want to use the Q function defined above from the incomplete gamma function. Now, that's sort of cumbersome. So what has been given to you is this very interesting uh, <laughs> table 
that basically says, depending on how many parameters you want to estimate, if you're doing chi-square at the 68.3% in the Gaussian case called one sigma, then this is one or 2.3 or 5.53, and this is your delta chi-square, which is, doesn't appear here, but this should be delta chi-square. Delta chi-square one, 2.71, four, nine, depending on your confidence. And these are joint confidence levels. Uh, now, this doesn't come out of, you know, my heart. It just comes from the queue, but it's just uh, something that Tim want to have in mind. And so, yeah, I think we are almost done. Also, we've defined chi-square, and now we want to do an extra step and go into likelihood, because remember in Bayes' theorem, you want to have the likelihood on one side to get then the posterior on the other side. And so there may be a relation, remember this, and so if you set P of D to be unity, then the prior gives the relation between likelihood and posterior. In many cases, you can invoke the central limit theorem and say, well, this will be Gaussian or a multivariate Gaussian, and then in your case, your likelihood is simply written like this. And this should remind you of a chi-square, because if I cancel this term here, if I drop it, this is exactly the chi-square, modulus a minus sign and a factor of one half. So, now that you can be a Bayesian, assuming that you plug something in there, what are your confidence level? Well, if you are Bayesian and say uh, you want uh, confidence level for parameter alpha, what you do, you simply integrate under your probability distribution in such a way that this integral gives you 0.683 or 0.95 or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Note that you are integrating over the hypothesis. So you are treating the hypothesis yourself uh, as a sort of random variable. So a frequentist will be horrified by this because you are integrating over an hypothesis. I mean, come on. So the classical, more frequentist approach is simply to take a likelihood ratio, and now we are not integrating over uh, the model space and say that this needs to be above or below a given th threshold. And so visually, you are doing like this, right? If this is a normal distribution, then you are doing this. And in higher dimension, you should imagine what that is. And so I'm going to leave you with a couple of questions for you. In what simple case can you make an easy identification of likelihood ratio with, uh, with a chi-square? And in what case you can make an easy identification between uh, likelihood and chi-square. And uh, I think since my time is almost up, and uh, basically I said uh, everything I wanted to say, I'm going to leave you with this. And I'll stop here and I take questions. We have questions. Is that everything was clear, or or we are all confused? I hope this is okay because I grabbed it from numerical recipes if I if I remember properly. <laughs> Delta chi square here. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. there? <laughs> well, that's a personal question. Uh, so <laughs> I. I started off learning about Bayesian inter inf uh, inference because basically that's what was being done routinely in, uh, in cosmology. But then I realized that for many problems, you may actually want to 
take the other point of view, and so I'm learning the frequency side also. How do we know what is a reasonable question? So if we ask, what is the value of the fine structure constant? Why is it the value it is? Why is the cosmological constant the value it is? How do we know if those are physics questions or if those are just you know, random occurrences, basically? Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, there is a hot debate going on about this. and. Um, I don't know if we <laughs> want to get into that discussion at this point of the day or if we want to get on that discussion after a few margaritas <laughs> during the long break. <laughs> I don't know what would be more productive. Uh, uh, what, uh, what I think it's, uh, it's useful at this stage is uh, for people to know uh, what the issue may be, what are the tried and tested tools that you have in your hands, and then discuss uh, down to what limit you can actually push your tools and which question you are willing to address and consider as a scientific question and, and where you draw the line and you say from here on it's a philosophical <laughs> question. I don't know if I answer. Any last questions? Yes, please. So you were mentioning um, with the Q value that if you error bars are underestimated or overestimated, you may have a higher or lower value. Um, is there any way to use that information to find out whether or not your error bars are inappropriate? Or, or is there a way to break the degeneracy between your model choice and your error bar estimation? Yes. Uh, there's probably more than one approach. Uh, I'm going to tell you towards the end of the, maybe it's the third uh, lectures, one way of going about doing that. But I can sort of give you the philosophy of this. Uh, basically, you can test whether you've got the right model or not by trying to see the predictability of your model. And so if you take the data and you split them in, say, a training set and a validation set for people that are doing photometric redshift, probably you've heard this many times before. Okay. And so if you have a training set and a validation set, is if your model is right, your Q value may be screwed up, but your validation set will be a good prediction from your model based on the training set. Right? And so this will tell you that maybe your error bars are wrong. Right? While on the other hand, if by splitting in different way between training and validation sets, uh, you find that, that you don't predict them, then your model is wrong. Right. OK. I went here the first session of, of the day. Thank you.